I have been listening to people talk about the Immersion Church for a long time, and I've been impressed. We spend a lot of time talking about this is the Omega, and yet um, I always had kind of in the back of my mind, I'm all like, well, what exactly was the Alpha? And I could give you a short answer and say, well, it was Kellogg, and he published a book called The Living Temple and its Pantheism. And then I'd hear these arguments back and forth. Well, was it pantheism? Was it panentheism? And things like that. And in the, the end of the day, I always felt just a little bit uneasy about calling something the omega and not understanding the alpha very well. And so the presentation that I'm going to be going into right now is a really hard look at the alpha. Um, when I started to do the research for this, I didn't realize what I was biting off. Uh, this is a really big subject, and um, uh, I know that there's a lot of people that know uh, a lot of history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and as I started to look into this, I started to see there's different ways of, of telling this history as well. And so um, I, I did a lot of research on this, and this is my best thinking on this subject. So with that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. The title of my presentation is Nothing New Under the Sun. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes tells us, The thing that has been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. The more I looked into this, the more I realized how true this statement was. Spirit of Prophecy tells us we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. That's really, really important. Now, as we're talking about whether we're talking about the Alpha or the Omega, the two ought to mirror themselves and they ought to be related. We ought to be able to see that relationship. And so I want to remind you of just a few things that we went over this morning. We talked about Jürgen Moltmann. And Jürgen Moltmann is, is part of, of what I believe is the Omega. He's in, inspiring the Omega in our church today. And he, he made this statement about atheism. And I want you to think of this maybe in terms of like, we also have atheism and science are kind of interchangeable in our society today. So think of that in terms of this as we're looking at this. The atheism that wants to free men and women from superstition and idolatry, the Christianity that wants to lead them out of inward and outward slavery into the liberty of the coming kingdom of God. These two don't have to be antagonists. They can also work together. And if you think of this as kind of like science and Christianity, it's almost like, I, I, I think that's a fair way to go ahead and characterize what he's saying. And then remember this guy, Teilhard de Chardin, saying, the cosmic body of Christ extends throughout the universe and comprises all things that attain their fulfillment in Christ, so that the body of Christ is the one single thing that is being made in creation. See, they're talking pantheism here. But keep this in mind. And, and this one in, in particular I want to keep, have you keep in mind. This is Ken Wilbur. He's the Buddhist. And he says, are the mystics and the sages insane because they all tell variations on the same story, don't they? Well, you know what? When you're talking about falsehood, He's right, and that's what I'm finding, and I think that's what we'll see here tonight. And then this statement that we read, Brian McLaren, I felt that every tree, every blade of grass, and every pool of water become especially eloquent with God's grandeur. And then moving on, we don't need to read the whole thing. We just, we just heard some of this this morning. But he goes on, he says, It was with exuberant joy of simply seeing these masterpieces of God's creation and knowing myself to be among them. It was to be one of them and to feel and to know that we, all of the creatures, molecules, and phenomenon, were together known and loved by God, who embraced us all into the ultimate capital letter, we. That way of writing, you're going to see again tonight. So anyway, John Harvey Kellogg and the Alpha of Apostasy. Um, I like seeing him on a bike. I don't know. He, we've got these kind of fun pictures of him. Um, he used to like to ride bicycles, and he'd have people taking their notes of what he had to say um, as he rode. 
But before you go, let's have this one caution from Spirit of Prophecy. Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. <coughs> this is a picture of John Harvey Kellogg when he was a young man. Um, he was uh, dedicated to the Lord as a young man. Um, there's an interesting story that he tells in his reminiscence. Um, it was a story where he came into um, the home, came in and saw his, his mother, and his mother asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, you know what, anything but a doctor. He had just been out with his friends, and um, one of the uh, uh, local doctors, um, someone had broken their leg, and the doctor was doing surgery on him and try to put it all back together, and he just thought it was a bloody, terrible mess. But, you know, after that, his mother took him aside and they knelt down by the bed and they prayed. And she dedicated his life to the Lord. And he says at that point, at that time, he said it was not about him and what he wanted to do, but it was how he could serve God and serve humanity. Moving along, I'd like to, to move along in our story to 1855. 1855, James and Ellen White relocate to Battle Creek. And it's at this time that they start the steam press. We start the, the, the printing ministry. Um, before this, uh, Ellen and James have been kind of itinerant. 1856, the Kellogg's moved to Battle Creek. There's 16 children in the family. Now, this is not a picture of the Kellogg's, but, but it's a picture I found with 16 people in the picture. So I'm thinking that's what their family might have looked like. Um, and there's, it's a small enough picture you can't see their faces. So you can imagine that being the Kellogg's. Um, they moved to Battle Creek and they start a broom factory. And that's a, a picture of an old broom factory. In 1864, John Harvey Kellogg gets his uh, first job outside of the broom factory. And he goes to work for John Harvey Kell I mean, he goes to work for James White um, in the steam press. And he goes there uh, to publish the Advent Herald. And his job is to sit there and set the type. And one of the things we know is he liked to read everything that they were printing. A couple years later, in 1866, the Whites start the Western Health Reform Institute. And here's a picture of it. Um, it was a small, essentially, sanitarium um, to treat, treat sick people. From 1869 to 1872, at this point, Kellogg has decided he's going to be a teacher. He believes that's what he's going to do, and so he attends a normal school. Um, for those of you that don't know, normal school means a place where you go to learn to be a teacher. That's the old word for it. Um, while he's there, he's inspired by the uh, works of social reformer Margaret Fuller. Now, as we look at John Harvey's life, he's constantly being inspired by reformers. And this is a time in America where there's a lot of reform going on in all just different, all kinds of different areas. But a lot of these reformers were spiritualists. And they come in different varieties. We're going to talk about them in a second. But uh, Margaret Fuller was uh, a bit of a universalist and a Unitarian. And uh, she, she was a reformer of the educational system. But all of that would change. Um, in 1872, the Whites, um, Merritt, uh, John Harvey's older brother, was working at the uh, Western uh, Health Institute, and they decided, you know, maybe John's a really sharp kid. We should send him to medical school, and he can come back and help us. And so, in 1872, he started on his medical education, and he continued on doing that into, through 1875. So he's doing the thing that he said he wouldn't do. It's interesting along in this, though, in 1874, there's a very interesting thing that happens, I think, at General Conference. Um, there was a question as to what John Harvey was saying, and um, they made a resolution, and here's what the resolution says. It says, whereas the impression has gone out from some unknown cause that John Harvey Kellogg, M.D., holds infidel sentiments, which does him great injustice and also endangers his influence as physician-in-chief of the sanitarium. Boy, I think I've got the wrong date on this, but you, you get the idea. 
This is early on. Resolved that in our opinion, justice to the doctor and the institute, yeah, this is 1879. I am so sorry, but uh, it's 1879. But it's resolved that in our opinion, justice to the doctor and the institute under his medical charge demand that he should have the privilege of making his sentiments known and that he be invited to address these assemblies on this ground upon the harmony of science and the sacred scriptures. Now, this is interesting though, because what's going on here is they're talking about, what's he gonna address them on? The harmony of science and the sacred scriptures. And if you kind of think back of those guys I was reading you before, Moltmann, he's worried about the harmony of science and Christianity, right? And that, that's dealing with this, this thing. So we're going to go back to 1872, 1876. Uh, Kellogg courts Mary Kelsey. Uh, this courtship goes on for some time, and it appears that they are truly in love. However, in 1876, Mary Kelsey and Willie White are married. And after that, the relationship between John Harvey Kellogg and Willie White was never quite the same. Um, however, in 1876, Kellogg was made superintendent of the Western Health Reform Institute. He immediately renamed it the Battle Creek Sanitarium. The word sanitarium is a word he coined. He also institutes a policy of being non-denominational. This would go on over time and become a stronger and stronger policy that he had. Now, it's interesting, if you look at uh, what Ellen White had to say, she initially said something about non-denominational. But what she said is, is we're going to be non-denominational and that we're going to treat all sick not just Seventh-day Adventists that need help. That was what she said. But he took this and moved it further to the non-denominational, like we mean the term today. The sanitarium went on to be very successful, and here are four very famous people. Pop quiz, how good of historians are you? <laughs> Who are those four people? Can anybody recognize? Got the first guy on the left, John D. Rockefeller. Who's the next guy? Henry Ford, who's the third guy? President Taft, and the fourth one? Harding. President Harding. And President Harding was married to? A Seventh-day Adventist. He yes, he was. And so anyway, so the Battle Creek Sanitarium went on to become a very big, successful thing. But let's go back, continue through our timeline. All was not well. In a letter to Ellen White in 1876, he said this, I know I have not that communion with Christ and that fullness of the divine spirit and influence that an active Christian ought to have. I know nothing of the emotional part of religion. I have theoretical faith, but am of such a doubting, suspicious nature that I cannot make a practical application of it. These kinds of exchanges would go on for years between um, John Harvey Kellogg and Ellen White, and it's a sad thing. And I think this shows, this shows one of his weaknesses. This is a chink in his armor. It's important for us to cultivate a full relationship with Christ. And I think it's very important for us to have that emotional part. Now, by that, I don't mean some kind of like a Pentecostal thing. But, but that tugging, we need to learn to... Con no, I don't want to use that word. We need to learn to, to look at the Lord and actually feel love. This needs to be a genuine relationship. What he says here, though, uh, mirrors so much of the modern mind, the modern mind that can't quite conceive of God, that's been led astray by ideas of evolution. He said this. This is in his reminiscences. He's talking about his life. He says, I was trying to believe in God and nature. I had two gods, but I couldn't, could not go on thus. I could not see how God could be above nature, so I had taken the position that God was not above nature. I believed that nature was almost equal with God. He said at this time in his life, he was particularly perplexed by this man, uh, Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel's very famous for the chart that you see next to him, and this is one. He was a uh, evolutionist, and he said that um, you could see in the embryo as uh, a man developed that um, he went through stages of evolution. Now, what's really interesting, this was before the days of being able to take a photograph through a microscope, I guess. And what he did with all of his research is he hand drew it all. 
Well, later in life, he was actually dragged in front of the University of Jena where he was working or got his degree or something like that, and they put him on an academic trial. And the reason why they did that was for fraud. And they actually said, this is fraudulent, this isn't true, you fabricated the whole thing. And so Heckel's main point was found to be false even by secular academia. Moving on, in 1879, Kellogg met Ella Eaton. And after a very short romance, in fact, one of his biographers says that when people were invited to the wedding, they wondered, who's John going to marry? And there she was, and they were married. Um, they never had any of their own children. Um, instead, they adopted 42 children of their own. So I guess what you do, do it with gusto. <laughs> So a little bit about the Battle Creek that, um, that they went to. Um, in 1855, um, there were a number of churches there. There was the traditional um, congregations there, but there were other people there meeting. There were the Hicksite Quakers, Universalists, the Swedenborgians, the Progressionists, and the Spiritualists, and they were all worshiping together. So we should say a little bit about who they are. I'll, I'll start with the... Uh, with the Universalists, because we kind of know them, they're kind of everybody saved, it's a universal kind of a thing. The Swedenborgians, that's a, something that will come up a lot if you ever study spiritualism. Um, they are uh, viewed as kind of part of the movement. Swedenborg uh, traveled around Europe and had um, visions where he believed that uh, he, he was given a new uh, idea, and the idea was something like this, is that there would be a new Bible, essentially, a new, a new revelation, and that there would be um, a new God. It wasn't exactly a new God, but, but he kind of took the Muslim view of the, of the Trinity and said that that's three gods, and said that there'll be just one, and it will be just Jesus Christ, and he'll bring in a new, a new, uh, new Bible. Well, so that's what, what the Swedenborgians said, and they're very mystical. And we, we have a famous Swedenborgian. Do you know who the most famous Swedenborgian is in American history? I'll give you a hint. He's before the Civil War, heading around all over the East Coast of the United States, planting trees. Johnny Appleseed, exactly. Uh, the Progressionists... The progressionists were a group of people that they basically believed we needed to have social pro progress. They were more about the social progress and the reform that needed to take place than they were so much about a spiritual um, thing. And then we have the spiritualists, which I'm going to tell you a lot more about. But let's, let's look at the Hicksite Quakers. You know, we've talked about Quakers, and Quakers seem to come up a lot when we're talking about the emergent church. Well, the Hicksite Quakers was a branch of Quakerism that was in um, conflict with the, what they called evangelical Quakers. And basically, these are two of the major branches of Quakerism. If you know your American history, you'll know that um, Quakers in the uh, colonial days were um, persecuted, and uh, sometimes they were, you know, th there was no religious freedom for, that, for them in some places because they weren't viewed as Christians. And the reason why is, is, is this, um, and this is what the Hicksite Quakers believed. Um, first of all, a little more history. The Quakers were founded by a guy named George Fox, and that's who George Fox University is named after. Um, one of the things he taught, though, is that though Fox used the Bible to support his views, Fox reasoned that because God was within the faithful, believers could follow their own inner guide rather than rely on a strict reading of Scripture or the word of clerics. And so, Everyone was to follow their own inner guide. And, and though he wasn't completely opposed to the Bible, nobody could tell you what it believed and, and what to believe out of it. But what it was, it was a very, it was a very your, personal, your personal walk, and don't let anyone tell you anything else. In fact, the Hicksites actually believed you only had to go to church uh, one time a year, um, although they did gather together uh, more often than that. But this is, this is the branch of Quakerism that was the one that was really called um, non-Christian um, that was getting the, uh, the Quakers into trouble. Now this guy right here seems like a pretty minor footnote in history and seems like a pretty minor footnote even in Adventist history, but, but I want to, to, to tell you about him 
um, because he's there in Battle Creek, and you're going to see something kind of interesting about him uh, that I promise in this, uh, in, in this presentation. A, few, a lot of interesting things. The other thing is he epitomizes the kind of thinking and um, religion that was going on in the community at the time. So uh, this is John Martin Pebbles. Uh, lived uh, from 1822 to 1922 and uh, was in Battle Creek at the time that John Harvey Kellogg was there. He was a physician, an author, he was a health reformer. He was a universalist, a spiritualist, and a theosophist minister there in Battle Creek. He was also president of the National Spiritualist Association. He also came out to California and started some schools and, and he also was part of the, uh, the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 after the World War I. But he's pastor of the Independent Congregation of Battle Creek, Michigan. Let's look at some of the things he says. First off, I'm going to weird you out, and I apologize. But I think it's important to understand that the spiritualists really did believe this kind of thing. He said this, I've seen tables, books, and other materials move without physical contact. Also, tambourines, violins, and guitars sail rapidly around a room by some unseen power, discoursing all the time delightful melodies. Can you say Walt Disney? He goes on, he says, I've heard the voice of my Indian friend Powhatan and other spirit voices as distinctly as I've heard the human, have seen the spirit form, grasped the spirit hand, felt the gentle spirit touch, and feasted upon the most enchanting spirit music when there was no individual in the earth form near me. You know, when this is, a, this is a brand of mysticism that we don't see so much today, but this is just mysticism. And really, we need to be careful when you see mysticism. I, stuff like this really did happen, I believe. And this is a scary thing. He says this, repudiating the pantheistic theory of God is a cold, vitalized force or unconscious principle, and the equally absurd church notion that he is a personal being standing outside the universe, much as a child rolls the hoop. Spiritualism endorses the idea that the infinite is a father, our father, living through all grades of existence. Man, some of this sounds good and some of this sounds terrible. Um, but it's interesting what he's saying here. Is he's saying, we're not pantheists, but then here he's got the father living through all grades of existence. So what's, what's going on here? I'll explain it in a minute, but I want to go through more of what he has to say. He says this, Man is the highest earth manifestation of the Father. Imputed righteousness, atonements, and special schemes of salvation are but priestly dodges to sustain the craft and secure the salary. So he's hostile to Christian belief. Spiritualism seeks to demolish sectarian barriers. Honor thy inner Christ, live the divine life. So let's try to unravel this pantheism issue. Pantheism is the belief that the universe or nature is the totality, or nature is the totality of everything is identical with divinity. So pantheism, this, this, this table, this, everything here is divin divine. Or that everything composes an all-encompassing eminent God eminent being everywhere. Pantheists thus do not believe in a distinct person or an anthropomorphic God. A distinct person is really saying, it's just saying the same thing. An anthropomorphic means that God is like us. He's like a, a man, he's like hands and, you know. So that's what pantheism says. And in its classic form, pantheism is kind of impersonal because in its most extreme form, it really does say everything, everything in this room, from, from the tablecloth, just everything is, is God. But then there's this idea, panentheism. Now, this was a term coined in 1828, so this would have been a very new term in Kellogg's day, and it was coined over in Europe, so it would take a little while to get all the way to Battle Creek. But basically what this guy, um, there's a mystic philosopher, Carl Krauss, uh, coined this term, and what he was saying with the term panentheism is pantheism plus monotheism equals panentheism. And if you think of the Hegelian dialectic, you can have one being the thesis, one being the antithesis, and then pan panentheism being the synthesis. And, and this is the idea that 
uh, pantheism is a belief system which posits that the divine interpenetrates every part of the universe. In other words, there's God in everything. He's penetrating into everything. God is viewed as the soul of the universe, the universal spirit present everywhere in everything and everyone at all times. But he's not the entire sum total, and he has some of the characteristics of monotheism. So he can have a, a, a personality and a, and a, a, a design. Um, you have to understand these are all kind of nebulous things, and they're not really, well, they're not based on the Bible. You have no thus clear saith the Lord. So people can play with these with these terminology as they go. But that's just to get in your mind panentheism versus pantheism, and, and certainly what we just read with pebbles is panentheism. In General Conference 1897, John Harvey Kellogg said this, the same divinity that was in Christ is in us and is ever seeking to lead us to the same perfection which we see in Christ, to the attainment of which there can be no hindrance except our individual wills. That's what he preached in 1897. Um, you can see he's getting there, just, just moving that way just a, a little bit. Um, later, he would write a letter to Ellen White, and it says this. Uh, he's talking about something that he coined. It's his biologic gospel. He says, those who meet the Lord when he comes will be above the power of disease as well as above the power of sin. They will reach this condition by obedience to truth. Alan White cautioned him that this, is not, that this is not right. But this is the direction that, that John Harvey Kellogg is going. He's going to this extra gospel, this extra idea that, that you have to have a biologic uh, transformation. Well, A.T. Jones got on board, and in 1898, he wrote this in the Review and Herald. Perfect holiness embraces the flesh as well as the spirit. It includes the body as well as the soul. Perfect holiness cannot be attained without health. Well, I wouldn't be so quick to amen this. Um, Ellen White had some things to say about this eventually. The Review and Herald uh, also went on to say this. Do you not see in this whole philosophy of health reform, do you not see by all this that in the principles of health for the body, the righteousness for the soul, both inwrought by the Holy Spirit of God, the Lord is preparing a people unto perfect holiness so that they can meet the Lord in peace and see him in holiness. I, I, I really should have put um, the quote from Ellen White that, that kind of goes into this, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have that quote here, and I'll find it if anybody wants it. But basically what she said was she was cautioning Kellogg on these principles was the idea that the health message is not the gospel. The health message is the right arm of the gospel, and it's to bring people to the gospel. And that is what she said. Um, and there's another piece of the story that I'm not telling you tonight because we just don't have time. But it involved the holy flesh movement in Ballinger. And that's a whole other thing. And the reason why I don't tell the story now with that is because Ballinger and Kellogg did not get along. But the interesting thing is, is that some of these other guys, like Jones and Wagner, got along with Ballinger. So, anyway. Moving on to General Conference in 1899, Wagner gets on board and he preached that neither disease nor death would come to those who had achieved physical and moral holiness. In 1899, though, we start to have an account by William Spicer. Spicer's a great dude. As I, as I, read, <laughs> as I read the stuff he writes, um, man, this guy's rock solid. He was a missionary to India. And while he was in India, he had to deal with all of these things. You know, he's dealing, at, he's, he's like at the, that's like the mother source of pantheism. And so he's seeing all this, and he writes a, he writes a, a, a great little um, a pamphlet called How the Spirit of Prophecy Met a Crisis. And it's all about for, um, um, it's all about Kellogg and the pantheism. This is what he says, when the peril arose and was recognized as the very thing against which the warnings had been uttered, we realized that truly the word of the Lord had been filled again as of old. Before it came to pass, I showed it to thee. This is what, Christ, this is what uh, Ellen White had wrote, and this is what Spicer was referring to. She says this, Christ came into the world as a personal savior. He 
represented a personal God. He ascended on high as a personal Savior, and he will come again as ascended to heaven, a personal Savior. We need carefully to consider this, for in the human wisdom, the wise men of the world, knowing not God, foolishly deify nature and the laws of nature. That is what she said, and that is what Spicer said. That's the, that's the prophecy we needed, and that's in 1899. She goes on in 1899, this is the General Conference Bulletin, and says, Idolatry of nature is a farce. It is the invention of men who know not God and who are trying to keep out of sight a knowledge of the true God. God has laws which he has instituted, but they are only his servants through which he affects results. In 1901, we start to see Kellogg develop his, his, his theology more of pantheism. He says this, Take the sunflower, for example. It looks straight at the sun. It watches and follows the sun all day long, looking straight at it all the time. And as the sun dips down below the horizon, you see that sunflower still looking at it. And as the sun turns round and comes up in the morning, the flower is looking toward the sun rising. It is God and the sunflower that makes it do this. Ooh, whoops. He went on and he said this as well. He said, the whole sanctuary question is the question of our bodies and of ourselves personally and not a question of architecture. Now, what did he mean by that exactly? He was taking the sanctuary message and taking the idea that our bodies are the temple of God and he was applying the health message completely to that and saying the question isn't about whether there's a sanctuary in heaven. So he was going right at the very heart of the sanctuary message. And what he was doing is he was taking our message and spiritualizing it away. Well, there had been a lot of warnings about the Battle Creek Sanitarium and what Kellogg was up to. And so on February 1902, there was a fire at the sanitarium and it was destroyed. Uh, There were no lives lost except one. And that was a patient who went back inside after he had gotten out and escaped the flames. He went back inside because he had his entire life savings in his room. Um, And he was the only life lost. Well, Kellogg came up with a plan after that. And his plan was to write the living temple. And the idea behind that is he's going to write this book. And then he's going to get people to sell it. And the proceeds from the sale of this book are going to pay for a new sanitarium. And so that same year, he drafted the, 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 uh, the Living Temple. Now, I just want to back up one thing. Um, he had decided the very night of the fire, when he found out he was on the train and he found out that the place had burned, he decided he was going to build it, rebuild again, and he was writing out all of the different ideas he had to build something even bigger and better. But Ellen White told him, don't do that. We need smaller ones in different places around the country. But he ignored that, and he went with this plan to write the Living Temple and have people sell that for that. It was drafted in 1902. It was finally published in 1903. So what I'm going to be talking about now is kind of the leading up to the sale of this and the printing. This is what Spicer had to say about this. Um, Spicer um, was asked to read an advanced copy before it actually went to press. Uh, A.G. Daniels um, asked him to do that, and so he did, and this is what he said about that. He said, but there was something supernatural in the working of this thing. We who first came in contact with the real inwardness of the teaching at close quarters had felt that power working in this philosophy. Friends of the teaching smiled at the idea that there was anything mysterious in it. For myself, I knew that there was mystic, hypnotic power in it. I knew by painful experience that I had to fight it, Resist it in my soul, or I would be swept off my feet. And I never got free of that paralyzing fear of it and the challenge of it in the face-to-face committee work. Yet some smiled at the idea of danger. These are a couple. I'm just going to read you just a few quotes so you can get an idea of what's in the living temple. He said this, Animal life and vegetable life are not merely kindred lives, but really one and the same. This sounds like McLaren, doesn't it? Every leaf, every blade of grass, every flower, every bird, even every instinct, as well as every beast or every tree, bears witness to the infinite versatility and inexhaustible resource of the 
one all-pervading, all-creating, all-sustaining, capital L, life. That's just like the capital W, we, right? He goes on and has this. God is the explanation of nature, not a God outside of nature, but in nature. A tree maker in a tree, a flower maker in a flower. There's all around us an infinite, divine, though invisible, capital P, presence. And I have one more. God actually entered into the product of his creative skill. He's talking about man. So that it might not only outwardly reflect the divine conception, but that it might think divinely and act divinely. God not only forms a man from the dust of the ground, but continues to form him as long as he lives. And the moment the creative process ceases, the walls of the temple totter and fall, its timbers fall apart, and the whole edifice crumbles back to dust. It's a pretty eloquent way of putting it, but what he's trying to say is that there's God in each one of us, divine divinity in each of us. Well, Spicer went to talk to Kellogg, and he wanted to know and be sure that he was understanding this correctly. And this is his account of his conversation that he had with Kellogg. Where's God, I was asked by Kellogg. I would naturally say he is in heaven. There the Bible pictures the throne of God, all the heavenly beings at his command, as messengers between heaven and earth. But I was told that God was in the grass and in the plants and in the trees, with motions to the grass and the trees about us as we sat on the open veranda. Where's heaven, I was asked. I had my idea of the center of the universe with heaven and the throne of God in the midst, but disclaimed any attempt to fix the center of the universe astronomically. But I was urged to understand that heaven is where God is, and God is everywhere in the grass, the trees, and all creation. Spicer went on to say, there's no place, oh, this is Kellogg talking some more. There's no place in this scheme of things for angels going between heaven and earth, for heaven was here and everywhere. The cleansing of the sanctuary that we taught about was not something in a faraway heaven. The sin is here, the hand pointing to the heart, and here is the sanctuary to be cleansed. To think of God as having a form in the image of which man was made, he said, to be idolatry. In any understanding I had of language, I was listening to the ideas of the pantheistic philosophy that I had met with in India. In fact, I was told that pure pantheism, as the earlier teachers conceived it, was indeed right. God was in the things of nature. With scripture terms and Christian ideas interwoven, it seemed the old doctrine of the Hindus, all nature, a very part of Brahma, and Brahma, the whole. Spicer got it right. He saw the whole thing, but the whole time he's being told, no, 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 this is okay. In fact, at Autumn Council in 1902, this is what A.T. Jones says. He says this, that we find in this book, the living temple, nothing which appears to us to be contrary to the Bible or the fundamental principles of the Christian religion, and that we see no reason why it may not be recommended by the committee for circulation in the manner suggested. So this happens in 1902 before the book is actually published. Then in December of 1902, the book is ready to go, the plates have been made, they're sitting in the Review and Herald, and it burns down. Praise God. In General Conference 1903, Ellen White had this to say. Spurious scientific theories are coming in as a thief in the night, stealing away the landmarks and undermining the pillars of our faith. God has shown me that the medical students are not to be educated in such theories because God will not endorse these theories. The most specious temptations of the enemy are coming in, and they are coming in on the highest, most elevated plane. These spiritualize the doctrines of present truth until there is no distinction between the substance and the shadow. At the General Conference in 1903, it's interesting to note that A.T. Jones was a serious candidate for General Conference president and that A.G. Daniels, who was the president, should be returned to the mission field. You know, as this kind of wrapped up, it was interesting. One other really important thing happened at General Conference in 1903, and that's this. They decided to move General Conference headquarters from Battle Creek to Washington, D.C. And if you look here, I don't know if you can see it, it's really hard to read, but I did a Google map on this and asked Google how long it would take to get there by train because that's how they would have traveled. And it takes a little over a day to get there. I think it was a day and nine hours. So that's how far they moved apart. And oh, in this day of communication, if we could only just move apart and have something 
work like this, but um, communication's too good today. Um, this is what was said, Spicer uh, says about this, um, when people were talking about whether it was a good idea to move the sanitarium or not. Uh, the people in, Wash in, uh, in Battle Creek were saying this, that the sanitarium remained, the tabernacle remained, the church remained, and Elder A.T. Jones and Elder um, E.J. Wagner and the others were, were with them, and we think the headquarters will still be here even if you move the general conference to Washington. Now, by God's grace, it didn't work out that way, and the plan to move to Washington worked. Um, so Autumn Council, 1903, Ellen White delivers a very important message to the church. And this is a famous one, and we've been quoting a lot from it as, as you've been listening to us give these entire uh, presentations. And uh, she was in... Uh, she was actually in St. Helena, but she was writing to them, and the message were getting there just on time, exactly when they need it at Autumn Council. This is what she says. This is what she wrote to them. One night, a scene was clearly presented before me. A vessel was upon the waters in a heavy fog. Suddenly, the lookout cried, Iceberg just ahead. There, towering above, high above the ship, was a gigantic iceberg. An authoritative voice cried out, meet it. There was not a moment's hesitation. It was a time for instant action. The engineer put, up, put on full steam, and the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. With a crash, she struck the ice. There was a fearful shock, and the iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with a noise like thunder to the deck. The passengers were violently shaken by the force of the collision, but no lives were lost. The vessel was injured, but not beyond repair. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. Then she moved forward on her way. Well, I knew the meaning of this representation. I had my orders. I heard the words, like the voice from our captain, meet it. I knew what my duty was and that there was not a moment to lose. The time for decided action had come. I must without delay obey the command and meet it. You see, up until this time, Ellen White had counseled the brethren to try to work with Kellogg, to try to love him in and to try to show him the error of his ways. But then there came a time, and God sent her this vision, meet it. And then she went on to say, the living con temple contains the alpha of these theories. I know that the omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled. For our people. She said, they make a no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob the people of God of their past experience, experience giving them in, instead a false science. She said, we are God's commandment keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to be cloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days is given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Amen. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth, which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle working power of our Lord. Amen. But the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved, as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. It was the message we needed for the time, and this message combined with moving the General Conference headquarters out of Battle Creek allowed the church to rally its forces and to meet this. And the church was able to go forward, and sure, we suffered some losses with Kellogg, but we met it, and we must meet it again. Now, just a little sideline about the Living Temple, just so you understand what this really is and who accepted it. Um, there's this magazine, it's the Herald of the Golden Age. 
The only reason why we know about this is because Spicer was traveling uh, to England. I think he might have been on his way back to India. And um, he saw a copy of this. And with the internet being what it is, we can actually go looking for it. Um, the Herald of the Golden Age is a spiritualistic journal. And uh, it was published in England. And there's an ad right there I was able to get for the Living Temple. You can see it, you can see it on there. And this is what they said in their review. In response to a great influx of spiritual illumination from higher spheres, there's apparent in every country of our Western world at the present time a wonderful awakening on the part of more highly evolved souls, John Harvey Kellogg, to the fact that it is our privilege to attain freedom from bondage to prevent material to prevalent materialistic thought. So we're going to be free from materialistic thought so we can have spiritualist thought. And this is what they said. The Council of the Order, these are the publishers, is so impressed with the importance and value of this book, The Living Temple, and feels so strongly that the information contained in its pages would prove of the greatest value to our members, co-workers, and converts that a special arrangement has been made with the proprietors for it to be supplied direct to the English public from our publishing office. Wow. Well, 1907, um, John Harvey Kellogg was disfellowshipped. Um, he had asked, this got delayed a little bit because he asked to have a trial. And uh, when they finally gave him a trial, he didn't even show up. Um, his brother, um, Will was also disfellowshipped about the same time. And Will had this to say. I said, basically, well, I guess it was probably the right thing to do. Um, I haven't been to church in 20 years. Um, even Kellogg didn't attend church much. He was mainly off seeing his patients. Um, it's interesting to look at who his influences are. After the spirit of prophecy, the person who he cited most as his influence was a guy not, named Herbert Spencer. Um, Herbert Spencer developed an all-embracing concept of evolution as the progressive development of the physical world, biological organisms, the human mind, and human culture and societies. It's actually from him that we get the idea of social Darwinism. Spencer is best known for the expression survival of the fittest, which he coined after reading Darwin's On the Origin of the Species. He said this, so we arrive at the point where religion and science coalesce. Um, Herbert Spencer was already thinking of these issues about what happens with Darwinism and spirituality. And he was developing a theory where these two ideas could coalesce. These are the forerunners to some of the things that we've been seeing with, with uh, the emergent church philosophers. Um, he was often quoted in Good Health, which is a magazine that uh, Kellogg printed. Um, and Kellogg often cited him as an influence. He embraced something called new theology or new thought. This is something that that's, um, we don't talk about much today. This is a little footnote of history that uh, has to do with spiritualism. And the spiritualists were into this thing called new thought. And part of the, one of the core teachings of new thought was the idea that what you think is kind of what you become. It's the direction that you go. So, so from there, we get things like the power of positive thinking. You've heard of that, right? And actually, that comes and runs right down through into um, um, the purpose-driven life and these kinds of books. All of these guys studied together. And um, um, anyway, new thought is actually with us a lot in the society around us. You'll, you'll see this, it's, it's, you know, you gotta think good thoughts, and if you think good thoughts, then good things will happen to you, these kinds of things. Ellen White had this to say about Kellogg. In the night season, I was shown a meeting. Dr. Kellogg was speaking, and he was filled with enthusiasm regarding his subject. His associate physicians and ministers of the gospel were present. The subjects upon which he was speaking was life and the relation of God to all living things. In his presentation, he cloaked the matter somewhat, but in reality, he was presenting scientific theories which are akin to pantheism. He presented them to being of the highest value. After looking upon the pleased, interested countenance of those who were listening, one by my side, 
told me that the evil angels had taken captive of the mind of the speaker. He said that we were to stand as guardians of the churches, but that we were on no account to enter into discussions on these subjects with those who hold pantheistic theories. He said that just as surely as the angels who fell were seduced and deceived by Satan, so surely was the speaker under the spiritualistic education of evil angels. It's amazing how a man dedicated, dedicated his life as a young child could fall like this. And it's not just John Harvey Kellogg that fell. A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagoner fell with him. They both went on to be employees of the sanitarium, um, both after they left the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, the sanitarium is a very interesting thing, a very interesting thing to study. I won't go into it too much, but John Harvey had made a big deal about this thing being undenominational or non-denominational. He always had a number of people on his staff that were not Seventh-day Adventists, some that we know were pantheists. Um, and it came to the point when these men left the church, they tried to take the sanitarium with them. It's a very interesting story. They don't run businesses like they do now, and they don't run the, the ownership of businesses like they do now. But over the years, John Harvey Kellogg had been systematically getting rid of the Adventists from the board and from being able to exert any control. But at the very last, his own methods came and bit him, and he wasn't able to attend a board meeting, and the Adventists all came, and they were able to secure it back. So we look at the Alpha, and what did we see in the Alpha? Spiritualism, mysticism, Eastern religion, pantheism or panentheism, personal divinity is ecumenical. The other things that we saw in the Alpha, we see Quakers, reformers, universalists, atheists, and science. Do we see this in the Omega? My word, it's like so much of it is all the same. I mean, even right down to George Fox, it all shows up right there. Ellen White said this, Rapidly are men ranging themselves under the banner they have chosen, restlessly waiting and watching the movements of their leaders. There are those who are watching and waiting and working for our Lord's appearing, while the other party are rapidly falling into line under the generalship of the first great apostate. They look for a God in humanity, and Satan personifies the one they seek. Multitudes will be so deluded, though their rejection of the truth that will so deluded that their rejection of the truth that they will accept the counterfeit. Humanity is hailed as God. Ellen White is talking about all of these, these same issues. These are, the, these are the same issues. Now, I said I was going to tell you something interesting about Preble. I was reading along and I realized in 1908 there was a conversation club banquet. And, you know, um, Kellogg would have these conversations. In fact, it, if you were to take a picture of it, it would look much, much like what we're seeing here today. There would be Kellogg up in front speaking, in this case it's me, not Kellogg, and he's speaking to, 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 the, to the audience and they're sitting around in the sanitarium listening to him expound on some subject, very similar to what we're doing here today. Well, they had one of these, it was a banquet, and the title of the banquet was A Complimentary Evening to Dr. Kellogg at the Sanitarium, April 22, 1908. This is a year after he's been disfellowshipped. And guess who's there? Reverend Preble. And he, he's, he told how he remembered in 1856, when Kellogg first came to town, he met a bright, sturdy, active, wide-awake boy playing in the streets. Now think about this. Think about this. This guy knew Kellogg back in 1856. Now, I don't know if he influenced Kellogg at all or not, 
But I can tell you this, looking at Kellogg and what he did with his life and the teachings that he had, the implications and the things he taught were in alignment with what Pebble taught, right? And by 1908, Pebble comes to the banquet and he's treated as a guest to make this statement. One has to wonder things that make you go, hmm. You know, there's a text, Proverbs 14, 12. You probably all know this one by heart. I think it's apropos for this. I'll take the time to look it up, though, and to read it. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end, therefore, are the ways of death. I believe that that is the verse, sadly, that sums up the Alpha. There's a lot of lessons that we can take from this, and I really, really would like you to go and think about this. The church was right in the heart of this, and this, this involved the very heart of the church. Look at the things that were going on. Look at those general conferences where, where Kellogg was getting away with saying the things that he did. And look at A.T. Jones and Wagoner. Aren't those two of the very brightest lights our church ever had? And look what happened to them. And there are plenty of other names that I didn't put in there. These were bright lights, bright lights in the church. And they got on the bandwagon and they went with Kellogg. And they all left. Now, by God's grace, there are a few that went out with, they didn't actually go out with Kellogg, but for a while they were enchanted by his teachings, like Prescott. He came back, and he was a firm fighter against Kellogg. So when we look at the emergent church today and the challenges that we face today, I believe that we are facing the omega and that it does parallel the alpha. But Spirit of Prophecy tells us this is going to be a startling thing, and, and she trembles for us. It must be worse. And so I think we're going to see more bright lights go out. This shouldn't surprise us. It should not make us happy. But it shows us the times that we, were, that we are living in. And I firmly believe that people like us, we have to know the truth. And we're going to have to carry the banner forward. And so I just pray that we'll all learn the lessons from the Alpha that we need so that we can go forward. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. If we can bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we will he heed those warnings. And that we will spend time reading your words so that we can be fortified and ready for what is to come. Lord, I just, I just pray and I tremble for our church. Lord, you, you know the beginning from the end. Lord, I just pray that each one of us and all of the good-hearted Seventh-day Adventists that we will Surrender our hearts to you so that we can be used by you to help finish the work and to help meet this crisis. We thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day that we've had together and this time that we could, that we could worship and learn. And I just pray that you would go with us now um, through the rest of the evening. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your son and all that you've promised us. We pray this in Jesus' name.